Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to our seminar series, Fluid Mechanics Seminar Series. Uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to present George Rigas uh, from Imperial College. Uh, George uh, uh, got his PhD from Aeronautics Department at Imperial uh, 2015, and then he passed his postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech and at University of Cambridge. Uh, and 2019, he joined the faculty uh, at Aeronautic Department in Imperial College. Uh, so uh, he's this all-round researcher that does experiments, uh, and theories, and a bit of simulation. So it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting stuff uh, on transition and control mostly of uh, turbulent flows. Uh, so today, large-scale coherent structures, turbulent wakes. Thanks, Arane. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, thanks all of you for attending uh, today. So uh, as Tarane said, I did my PhD at Imperial College. And actually, that was the first uh, thing I did research on. Uh, then I spent some time uh, away from Imperial. And when I went back to Imperial, I started revisiting again with a new experience. We had that problem. Uh, the motivation behind that is to understand the wakes of large objects like uh, this track. And despite the fact that the flow around the track seems so complicated, actually most of the drug we consume to propel this body uh, is uh, consumed in the near wake. So we spend approximately 50% of the fuel just to overcome the wake losses due to the large scale coherent structures in the near wake of this vehicle. And this is a typical situation for most of the vehicles moving in a fluid at realistic Reynolds number relevant to the automotive uh, industry. Of course, uh, we separate these flows from uh, streamlined flows. Uh, this is a pressure dominated flow that the difference between the high pressure in the front and the large pressure in the back is causing uh, the drag. So what we can do about that? Uh, many people, uh, companies like Tesla, they've been working intensely on improving their aerodynamics using passive uh, techniques. And uh, when I was in California, actually, we saw these devices uh, manifesting uh, in the highways. It's a boat tail. Uh, it's creating like a cavity in the base of the body. And actually, this has been shown to stabilize some wake instabilities and reducing the drag 4 or 5% approximately. As you can understand, this is very impractical. And why there is nothing else? Because actually, we have no idea about uh, what are the wake dynamics dictating uh, the drag losses in, uh, in the near wake. This is very well summarized uh, in the annual review of Choi as well, that our current understanding of the flow in the wake of uh, these big uh, uh, vehicles is far from being sufficient to provide realistic uh, base drag reduction devices. So uh, back then I was thinking more as an engineer, a bit less as a scientist, and uh, we thought, okay, let's try to do the following experiment. Uh, let's try to streamline the body to reduce the pressure losses. Uh, instead of uh, having additive geometric modifications, uh, we said, let's have a set of jets that virtually are going to streamline the body, and somehow they're going to manipulate the flow in order to minimize the drag. So uh, that was the design during my PhD. Uh, we made this axisymmetric bluff body. It's a generic bluff body. Uh, this is one of the old wind tunnels at Imperial College. We refurbished them recently. And uh, this is quite a sophisticated experiment because although it looks like a cylinder only, there is a speaker inside uh, that is creating a synthetic jet through a, a Helmholtz cavity. So uh, when I'm driving uh, this speaker with a sinusoidal frequency, I can create an axisymmetric vortex ring that is creating this virtual streamlining that I showed you. And on the right hand side, I show the base pressure change. Uh, blue means I increase the base pressure, so I decrease the drag. And you can see we can achieve approximately 35%, which corresponds to 20% uh, drag reduction. OK, this is all good. But uh, when we measured actually the power consumed by this actuator, we showed actually that the efficiency is approximately 1. So what I spent, I take it back only as a drag reduction. So impractical solution. And there is a specific reason for that. We are trying to actuate the flow through mean flow modifications through perturbations uh, in this case. So this motivated us to actually have a look, a deeper look into the dynamics of the bluff body wakes. And we're going to follow two approaches. We're feeling very comfortable now about the laminar regimes 
defined for Reynolds number based on the diameter less than 1,000, for which we're going to follow an exact theory based on the Navier-Stokes equations, stability theory, either linear or nonlinear, that corresponds to exact solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. And for these practical applications at high Reynolds numbers, like the experiment I showed you, we really have no idea how to tackle numerically in terms of equations these problems. So we're going to rely on experiments to understand what are the dominant dynamics of this flow and then try to extend some of the operator-driven approaches that we have at lambda regimes to fully turbulent ones. And I will conclude with some uh, practical control applications we have demonstrated. So this is a series of DNS simulations we performed. Uh, it's uh, exactly the same uh, geometry as the one we did the experiments. Uh, we can see that uh, as we increase the Reynolds number, starting from an axisymmetric flow, of course, at the viscous limit, we respect all the symmetries that they generate the wake that are defined by the boundary conditions of the body. And at Reynolds number 550, we have this first symmetry break and route uh, to turbulence. So actually, this is the way we see transition to turbulence as a spatial temporal symmetry break phenomena. The first one, we break a spatial symmetry, specifically the azimuthal rotational symmetry. And you can see the wake, if I plot the vorticity at a plane near, uh, near the base, has been displaced off center. And any force will be off the center if I calculate the total force instantaneously. So I don't have any more rotational symmetry. I have lost one symmetry. And as I increase the Reynolds number, I start breaking even more symmetries. The second one is a temporal symmetry. This is the classical vortex heading regime that we have a specific frequency through approximately 0.15 uh, in, uh, in the near wake. Of course, at high Reynolds number, the wake uh, becomes uh, quasi-periodic and chaotic, but I will focus only on the first uh, two regimes. And what I will show you through the first part of this talk is that exactly these two symmetry breaking phenomena are the ones dictating the fully turbulent regimes observed in canonical three-dimensional wakes. So uh, starting with a laminar linear stability analysis to quantify exactly what is the sequence of these bifurcations, we can start, uh, I assume most of you, you are familiar with this methodology, just a linearization of the Navier-Stokes. Uh, at order zero, we can solve the steady Navier-Stokes equations, which are called uh, these solutions base flows. These are fixed points, exact solutions of the steady Navier-Stokes equations. These are nonlinear solutions. We have the u naught dot uh, grad u naught term here that we find solutions using a newton raphson method and at order one solving the linear agent value problem to find these instabilities actually we end up with a huge uh, large scale uh, three-dimensional problem that we have to use uh, parallel uh, algorithms uh, in pet c actually to solve uh, to solve this and actually it was a bit challenging uh, to, to get these solutions uh, so uh, we calculate three things uh, during the stability analysis. The one is the base flow Q0. At low Reynolds number, this is fully axisymmetric. As we said, it respects the symmetries of the body. Uh, if we plot the agent value spectrum, we will see at some point at Reynolds number 425, there is a steady agent value crossing the imaginary axis. So there is an associated agent mode with that. And I'm plotting here the agent mode associated with this pitchfork bifurcation that breaks the rotational symmetry in the near wake, as we showed through the DNS simulations. Of course, this is a linear stability analysis. It doesn't tell us anything about the saturated regime. And uh, actually, uh, Lev Landau proposed that en route to turbulence, there is an infinite number of bifurcation taking us there. Subsequently, Trevor Stewart at Imperial showed how you can get exactly amplitude equations based on the theory of Landau, directly based on the Navier-Stokes equations using adjoint techniques. Although nowadays we know that it's not an infinite number of bifurcations to achieve turbulence, but it's only a finite number of them, like the ones I will show you here. So uh, people uh, that are good in math, and typically these people are usually in France, like the group of Denis Sip in uh, at an era, they have extended this theory for code dimension two bifurcations, and actually they have shown how you can get these amplitude equations which describe the evolution of either steady or unsteady bifurcated modes uh, using simple equations like a linear term and a cubic term that if I throw it back in the Navier-Stokes equations, 
is an exact solution of the governing equations at the order of truncation. Here it, it is a cubic order. So we can either use a theory or we can just take the unstable agent mode, throw it back in the Newton solver and converge to a new steady, stable, nonlinear equilibrium that actually now this one is going to be a fully three-dimensional uh, regime that has broken the symmetry. For those of you that comes from a statistical or particle physics background, this can be described directly as a spontaneous symmetry break that the stable axisymmetric wake is respecting all the symmetries. I have a stable potential associated with that. And actually what happens when I increase the Reynolds number, any perturbation becomes unstable at the center. I fall down and depending on the initial conditions, I can end up at any lower level energy of the potential well. Okay, this is purely the azimuthal angle is purely dependent on the initial conditions uh, of the stability analysis or the DNS calculation. So I have ended up at that regime and if I continue the stability analysis I find also the second unsteady bifurcation and what was really interesting here is uh, that if I plot the mode associated with the second unsteady bifurcation we have seen that now inherits the symmetry properties of the steady full thread full three-dimensional base flow and vortex heading actually instantaneously is tilted towards one side of this axisymmetric bluff body. Okay, that was a bit counterintuitive. You would never imagine that you have non-axisymmetric vortex heading coming out of an axisymmetric bluff body. And actually it was a bit tricky in the beginning, especially when we saw these uh, results in the experimental measurements. So, what did we do next? Uh, we went to the turbulent regime. We increased uh, the Reynolds number to 200,000. Uh, recently, also one of my PhD students, uh, co-supervised with Jonathan Morrison at Imperial College, uh, did the second experiment uh, using particle image velocimetry. So we recorded uh, the velocity uh, structures in the near wake. You can see there is no coherence here. There are no modes. Everything is fully chaotic. You can see small scale structures. This is the streamwise velocity that uh, we're plotting here. And we're capturing approximately one to two diameters near the base of the body. This is where most of the things are happening. Uh, the turbulent, the boundary layer is fully turbulent before separation. So we can see a very wide logarithmic region being developed just before we separate to make sure that actually uh, we're in a fully turbulent regime. And also simultaneously, and that was one of the nice things of this experiment, we can measure uh, many quantities uh, in a synchronized way. So we can record also a time result base pressure uh, measurement uh, in this way. So what we can do with all this data, we can start thinking about looking into the dynamics. All of them are time resolved. So the first thing uh, we did is we took all these sensors the pressure sensors, we performed an azimuthal Fourier decomposition and we plot the power spectral density in a pre-multiplied spectrum where Struhal is the frequency and in the y-axis is the pre-multiplied power spectral energy. Why do I do that? Because everything that I see as an area now corresponds to energy, so regions of uh, high area under these curves that will tell me where most of the energetic coherent structures live in. And we can see different peaks. The first peak we can identify is peak D, which is the vortex setting identified at Struhal point two with an azimuthal wave number M plus minus one. So we have immediately more or less identified actually the persistence of the vortex setting at high Reynolds numbers. Uh, we identify another peak with an axisymmetric mode. This is a bubble pumping mode, Struhal point, point one. This is also something that has been reported in the literature related with uh, bluff body wakes. And uh, for the first time, actually, uh, back then, we found another peak at Struhal number 0.001. is an extremely low frequency peak, 100 times slower than the vortex heading frequency. So the first time I saw that, I said, OK, I messed up my experiment. Something is going really wrong. So we had to go to four different wind tunnels to make sure actually this, is, this exists. We even revisited 
the accuracy of the, of, of the design, of the mechanical design of the body so that we don't break any symmetry to make sure everything is there. And how do these modes look like? Uh, we did a POD trying to understand what is happening dynamically and what probably these peaks correspond to. And POD didn't tell us anything. POD told us that, OK, you have some modes with m equal 1 and m equal 0. So nothing spectacular. And uh, this is where we started thinking about the symmetries of the problem and the knowledge we had from the laminar regimes. So we defined a quantity, which we can think as an order parameter, similar to uh, a mean field theory, let's say from Landau. And in that case, the center of pressure has a really nice property. So the center of pressure will tell me that if the flow is rotationally symmetric, the value of the center of pressure will be zero. So any force will be located at the center of the body. Otherwise, uh, it will be non-zero. And on the left-hand side, I'm plotting exactly the PDF of the center of pressure. So that was the first fascinating result. We saw that instantaneously, the wake never has rotational symmetry. So most of the time, has broken the rotational symmetry, and it evolves at this non-zero center of pressure uh, PDF that is, looks like a donut. So uh, randomly, the center of pressure is meandering, exploring all the possible azimuthal angles that we have here. And based on that simple thought that is randomly reorientating, actually we can perform a conditional averaging of the base pressure. And that was the first time that we were able to show that actually the mode that we get if we conditionally average on the rotating reference frame corresponds exactly to the steady symmetry break mode that we identified at transitional uh, low Reynolds numbers. Of course, at the long time average, we achieve an axisymmetric base pressure, and we know that turbulence recovers statistically all the broken symmetries due to ergodicity at the long time average. But that was really important because actually this is the backbone of the large scale structures, what lives under the turbulence that we see as rotationally uh, restored statistics actually has nothing to do like that in an instantaneously statistically average sense. And why would you care about symmetry break now for the applications is because actually these symmetry broken states are associated with high drag. And we can see that experimentally as well by correlating the center of pressure with a uh, pressure coefficient, which, as we said, the pressure coefficient on the base, it will be more or less related with the total drag of the body. So what I show is the radial PDF. This is the brown curve, and we can see that most of the time I have a symmetry broken state. And if I plot the pressure coefficient associated with that, we'll see that it has its lowest value at the most probable symmetry broken location. So when the wake breaks the symmetry, actually the drag increases, so the pressure reduces a lot. So now we can start thinking as well about symmetrization techniques. So if I wanted to symmetrize the, if I wanted to stabilize the wake, I should symmetrize it and remove all the symmetry broken dynamics and restore the original axisymmetry of of the experimental setup, which would correspond to a zero center of pressure state in the near wake. And uh, till now, please. Sure. No, no, I can hear you. Pressure or what? So this is pressure tap. It's normal pressure on the surface of the body. It's not in the wake. Okay, it's, it's, it's the initial pressure, the normal constraint, the total normal constraint, and you are also responsive to the distribution. No, this is static pressure on the base of the body. So we have a reference pressure measurement above the body in the far stream and we have the differential pressure measured between the body and the reference pressure. Yeah. But actually that observation that we showed just now uh, is, th is nothing new, the persistence of the coherent structures. Uh, Brown and Roscoe, they have demonstrated this one really nicely. I saw it probably somewhere in one of 
uh, the visualizations in the wall on, on the fifth floor, that we see a mixing layer and a large scale coherent structure transitioning from the laminar to the turbulent regime. And based on that approach, we propose the following modeling strategy. So why we don't think of the coherent structure as a big mass, like described in the Brownian motion, emerged in a fluid bath. Okay? In that case, at large time scales, it would undergo diffusive motion. And based on this argument, we can actually merge the deterministic treatment that we have symmetry breaking bifurcations and exact solutions, like the Stuart Landau models we showed earlier. And we can augment these equations with stochastic forcing. So, extremely simple, just the physics observations we had, exact models plus Brownian motion as a stochastic forcing. So, this is a stochastic differential equation now. It's not so easy to predict its temporal behavior. But what is really interesting about SDEs is that the probability density function evolves in a deterministic wave and actually is governed by the Fokker Planck equation. And this is actually what I plot on the top left is the potential associated with the Fokker Planck equation of this stochastic differential equation. That you can see it looks like a Mexican hat, as we showed earlier. And any initial condition in the presence of turbulence will fall, will become nonlinearly stable, and randomly it will start reorientating in this potential well, leading to the PDF we see on the right hand side. And if we can compare, if we lay down the probability that I showed you earlier from the model, we compare with the experiment, we see a relatively good agreement. And now, probably most of you, you're going to start thinking and doubting okay, turbulence is not white Gaussian noise, and this sounds too simplistic to be true. So I would agree with you, okay? But the only thing I can do is I can go back to my experiment and I start doubting or uh, challenging that. So I plot the angular mean square displacement of the experimental measurements. So actually, we take the experiment, we have two, two directions, an angular uh, direction and a radial one. So I can plot the angular mean square displacement. And actually, we can see a perfect fit with the prediction of the diffusive motion of that model and the experimental measurements. In the radial direction, we see the linear scaling of the diffusive motion only for low time scales. And actually, the reason for that is because we're constrained by the walls of the potential well. At, we cannot explore all the reorientations actually at large uh, time scales. But actually, remember that we have a nonlinear model. And actually, it's the nonlinearity that gives us the saturation at large uh, time scales. So the model seems more or less to work uh, quite well to a reasonable extent, uh, qualitatively and quantitatively, to capture some of these uh, dynamics. And we can extend that to other types of geometries and actually symmetries. We can start thinking of discrete symmetries or continuous symmetries like the one we showed here. Uh, but the question is what happens when you don't know what is the underlying symmetry of, or when you have approximate symmetries in your system. Of course, I can derive the normal form of any of these systems purely on symmetry arguments. Like in the rotational case, it was the equation I showed you earlier in the previous slide, like uh, this one. But what happens when we have no idea either about the normal form or even the noise assumption that we make. For example, is the noise colored? Is the noise state dependent? So uh, this is uh, some recent work we published earlier this year, and actually with uh, contributions from uh, uh, JC, who is here, JC Lajo, and Steve Branton, uh, with one of his PhD students, Jared Callahan. Actually, we came up with a numerical framework to identify purely on data, uh, stochastic differential equations, I think the novelty of that was not only to identify the coefficients of a known form, but actually to approximate what is or discover what is the form associated with the underlying process that can have approximate symmetries in that case. So we do that by actually iterating between the forward and the adjoint Fokker Planck, such that we achieve statistical consistency between observations and model predictions. So we did that test for the axisymmetric bluff body wake. We saw exactly that the deterministic part for the radial direction is exactly as we would expect. And actually, the stochastic part 
can have some, some corrections that uh, we're really interested now to understand a bit more how these appear and you can see that the noise starts becoming dependent on the state of, of the system which might sound reasonable but still we're trying to think why that might be the case. And how do we discover this kind of normal forms? We perform a sparsification uh, procedure so we have a dictionary in that case we have all the possible polynomials associated uh, with a form we want to, uh, to approximate and based on a cost function about accuracy and simplicity of the model we can start weighting the relative contribution of how many additive terms I will have versus what is the accuracy or overfitting that I will have in my model. Okay, all this I showed you till now was based on pressure and uh, what uh, uh, Tai Hanks did uh, uh, recently was to analyze also the velocity measurements. Despite that the wake, as I showed you, was extremely chaotic or turbulent, the first few POD modes, they seem to be extremely coherent, as you can see here on the right-hand side. And trying to understand what these POD modes correspond to and how they relate to the symmetry breaking instabilities, uh, we started, we did actually we plot the power spectral density of the amplitude coefficients of these POD modes of the, of the first four ones. We see a coherent peak at Struhal point two, and we see a low frequency peak as well. So I will start with a low frequency peak. So this is exactly the mode we showed at low Reynolds numbers. Now we can identify the, spa uh, the spatial structure of that also at high Reynolds numbers, and we can see actually an extremely good agreement uh, qualitatively uh, between the shapes. On the left, I show just the Reynolds number 400 mode. On the right is the one from the experimental data. This is the symmetry break, the steady mode, that is mode one that peaks at Struhal zero. And actually, it was really challenging with the PIV to resolve that. That's why this one is not going all the way here because it's a hundred times slower than this. And if you do time result PIV, this actually becomes really, really challenging. So this one is a vortex heading mode, is a pair of traveling modes that they give rise to the vortex heading. And we have another mode as well, the axisymmetric bubble pumping, that I never actually understood why people cause, call it or how it appears. So this is just an axisymmetric pulsation as people have reported in the literature of the whole of the whole wake. But now we can start and play this, the same game as we did with the pressure. We can start thinking about what are the underlying symmetries of the problem and how we can conditionally average the wake to extract exactly the nonlinear uh, dynamics that are observed uh, in the flow. So what we did, we said, okay, we have the PIV experiment and the PIV experiment is only in one slice, so I can have only two states instead of an infinite number of states in the azimuthal direction. But based on the amplitude of the first POD mode, I can understand the state of my wake if the wake is on one side or the other, so I can perform a conditional average based on that. So if I do that, we can identify the two regions, so the wake is tilted towards one side or the other, and based on that, on the conditionally average now, wake, I can perform a conditionally average POD analysis. So I will choose not only both states, so I have two options, either I will choose only one or I will take the other one, reflect it so that it respects the same symmetries as the first one and perform the POD analysis and actually in that case the modes become asymmetric and exactly the same way I should expect to find them from the nonlinear solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. This is for the steady symmetry break mode at Suhal zero. And this is the vortex heading. We can see now clearly that the vortex heading as well inherits the symmetry properties of the steady symmetry break mode and is one-sided. And now it compares really well with the modes we expected to find. And I want to point out that actually the axisymmetric bubble pumping mode can have a different interpretation based on the stochastic forcing. So this mode here corresponds to random reorientations in the azimuthal direction, but now we can think about random oscillations also in the radial direction. 
and this will introduce a new diffusive time scale. Not as slow as this one, but somewhere in between, because I'm constrained by a length scale introduced actually by the diameter of the body, which tells me where this wall in the potential lies. And actually, this is the interpretation that we have for the bubble pumping, that the whole wake is randomly reorientating and randomly also tilted towards one side while it's oscillating in the radial direction. So this summarizes more or less the first part of my talk. And here I have some conclusions about the persistence of the laminar symmetry breaking instabilities. Uh, we have some original papers from 2014 and 15, and the recent work with uh, JC and Null, and we're preparing a manuscript. Uh, but what I want to emphasize on is actually on the last part that we had to perform a symmetry conditional uh, POD analysis to extract exactly these invariant structures we observed. And uh, this is work that I'm doing now with Simon, who is here at the audience, and Tarane as well, in collaboration with Peter Smith and Dennis Sip. And actually, what Simon did, he formalized this conditional symmetry analysis for any kind of symmetry that you might have in any kind of measurement. So he did that in a smart way, using modern machine learning theory. So specifically, he used autoencoders. Uh, in the simplest case, where you have an encoder and a decoder that are linear, you can prove that the subspace of the solutions of these two are exactly identical. So you can perform a POD analysis using that linear autoencoder framework. But actually, what is really interesting is you can go to the nonlinear regime as well by introducing nonlinear activation functions. So you can approximate, based on a universal approximation theorem associated with the neural networks, any kind of nonlinear function. But in the same time, you lose some interpretability of the results. Uh, what is important here is that the invariant solutions arising because of symmetries in the data, they are causing problems in the model reduction. And one of the reasons, we showed it earlier, that modes appear to be symmetric, whereas, for example, the underlying uh, modes are uh, fully uh, non-symmetric and non-linear. So uh, we will give a better definition of why, what we define an invariant solution. So if we have a set of PDs, like the Navier-Stokes equations, and we have a symmetry operation gamma, which can be a rotation, reflection, or any kind of affine transformation, in that case, the, so the equations are equivariant under the symmetry operation gamma, which means that my solutions U are invariant to these symmetry operations. And we can have different either discrete or continuous symmetry operations, like the reflection I showed you earlier. And actually what POD did, because of ergodicity, is it symmetrized in both with these reflectionally symmetric states, whereas when I did the conditionally average POD, I had the proper nonlinear structure. It appears to be a bigger problem when you have advection, like traveling waves. If you try to do a model reduction when things are traveling, or when you have a pipe flow, and an exact coherent structure appears and randomly reorientates in a streamwise direction, which is a relative orbit. In that case, actually, the modes we will see that they become a Fourier basis, which loses completely the interpretability of the solutions. So this summarizes more or less both of what I told you. So the symmetry reduction is really important because different states with different uh, symmetries, actually they're encoded in different spaces uh, in the phase space, so actually we can have exactly the, the same state rotated or reflectionally tilted, let's say, but actually it's the same state and actually what we do, we encode it in different uh, regions, so we augment the dynamics without having to. And the second case is that actually the POD modes, and this is something that we actually we might have to revisit, is they inherit the symmetries of the underlying symmetry operators acting on my system. So they become non-interpretable, and when you have a periodic direction, actually they become Fourier modes, and the same happened as well with axisymmetric wake, that the first modes were purely Fourier modes. So there are different solutions uh, proposed to that. Uh, one of them for continuous direction uh, comes uh, actually from particle physics, and this is the method of slicing. Uh, is also invariant polynomials for discrete symmetries. 
but this one is not straightforward at all either to come up with or to implement it and both of these methods they require a data modification that is not trivial so what simon did uh, he came up with this really smart framework how to impose invariance in a proper orthogonal decomposition method so if you have a continuous direction you can discover what is the optimal shift operator and the optimal shift for each snapshot that you have, that you have to translate all your snapshots such that they become aligned over the full data set. So this is for the continuous symmetries. And then we have discrete symmetries. So what we do in that case, we perform each discrete symmetry transformation that we can have in the data, and we pick always the one that is more reliably reconstructing the data. So the one that is minimizing the reconstruction. So in the simplest case that I had two reflectionally symmetric states, I would have only two autoencoders, which are exactly the same. It's called the Siamese branch. And I would pick always the one that respects a specific symmetry that I want to keep track. So now afterwards, we retransform back in the original uh, uh, in the original space, both the discrete and the continuous solutions, and we are minimizing now a few quantities during uh, back propagation of the error. We're trying to find what is the optimal shift, as I said, what is the optimal branch at each snapshot that we have to keep, and also what is the weights associated with the encoder and the decoder, which would give rise to the POD modes if we have a linear decomposition method. So this is a demonstration for a canonical example. This is a Kolmogorov flow that you have actually continuous uh, symmetry in the streamwise direction and in uh, the vertical direction. You have a forcing with a specific wave number in Y that gives actually rise to a certain number of discrete and continuous symmetries that you can see here. Specifically, the combination of rotation and shift and reflect symmetries give rise to 16 different types of symmetries here in the system and if actually we do this symmetry aware proper orthogonal decomposition analysis now we can find what is the optimal shift and reflect or the optimal discrete symmetry that we have at each snapshot we can find what is the optimal shift we have in the translation but also we can find what are the optimal modes okay and this is what i'm showing here so on the left hand side so this is a PDF, actually, is, uh, for the Siamese branches, what symmetries my system is exploring. So out of the, all the possible symmetries, I can see that there is a frequency of uh, visiting some symmetries uh, more often. And S is actually the shift that I have to perform to each of my snapshots, such that the underlying space becomes invariant to the original symmetries of the system. This might not tell you a lot, but probably this one will persuade you about the interpretability of the results. So on the top, I see if I perform POD or PCA analysis, and you can see that the POD modes, they are non-interpretable. They are Fourier modes in the streamwise direction, whereas in the symmetry aware PCA framework, actually the first mode becomes an equilibrium solution, and the second and third mode, they seem to be modes associated with a vortex pair, which actually relates very well to some exact coherent structures calculated for this specific flow. And one of the interesting questions now that arises is what is the relationship between these data-driven discovered modes with the nonlinear exact coherent structures based on the operator approach? Wh why this is important? Because now I can quantitatively also compare what is the efficiency of reconstructing the flow using PCA or SPCA, and actually if I use only two symmetry aware PCA modes and I project on the original PCA space, I can see that I recover the energy of approximately 100 modes with only two symmetry aware modes. We can go a step further and we can introduce as well nonlinearity in the neural network so we can have nonlinear coupling between these two symmetry aware modes and now we can capture approximately the energy even better of the first 100 PCA modes, as you can see here. So these are the conclusions of, uh, of the second part. Uh, feel free to have a look in the recently uploaded archive that we have here. 
and there is an associated GitHub code as well with that if you want to play. I'm pretty sure uh, you might have systems with symmetries and actually examine a data-driven uh, way actually to discover uh, the optimal dynamics of your system. I'll take a breath now. <laughs> and I'll go to the last part, which is about control. Now we start thinking as an engineer again. And the problem I will have as an engineer is that not only I have a fully three-dimensional flow that I have to control that is turbulent, but it's also partially observable, meaning, as we discussed, I can have only pressure sensors, typically on the body, which tells me, gives me, instead of uh, full observability in the system, it gives me only partial observability. And I will use already existing control devices for active control, and now we can start thinking a bit wildly, like, there are these flaps, can I start moving them to achieve a stabilization of the wake? Or in high-performance cars, I have active devices. Can I move them in a smarter way to achieve stabilization in the wake? So uh, to do that, we went now this time to the new wind tunnels. Uh, these are uh, the national wind tunnel facilities uh, of Imperial College. We, we designed the Nahmed body, which is a canonical body actually to, to examine the aerodynamics of road vehicles. It reproduces most of the dynamics like ground effect, three-dimensionality, high Reynolds numbers. And this is the model with two flaps on the side that we can move with smart actuators. So we use the models. We had derived the stochastic ones, augmented with a control uh, term, beta b times u. And uh, based on standard control uh, theory, uh, we designed linear controllers such that, as we said, we stabilize the symmetry breaking dynamics. So the center of pressure that I showed you earlier for the axisymmetric body, the same happens here. I have only by stability. I want to make the center of pressure y, that is by stable between two locations, left and right, to become zero. When I turn the controller on, actually this happens, and I get a significant reduction of 3%. However, why only 3%? If we look at the spectrum of the center of pressure for this case, we see that from the black, we achieve the yellow one. So we have stabilized the steady symmetry breaking dynamics. However, we always excite another set of the dynamics associated here with the vortex setting. And what we did, we tried to model the vortex setting, but there was always something that we were missing. So always there were some dynamics. I would change a bit the Reynolds number. I would miss some other dynamics, shear layer dynamics. And this is where actually now we're trying to explore a new type of approach for designing purely data-driven controllers based on reinforcement learning. So instead of the model-based control approach I showed you now, we're going to use a machine learning technique called reinforcement learning that by interacting directly with the environment, I will discover optimal nonlinear controllers by passing completely the modeling phase. And there are many different, uh, actually, uh, demonstrations of that recently. Uh, the group of Petros Kumuchakos has shown also in the case of partial observability how you can learn the optimal way that two fish, they have to swim next to each other to minimize the drag. And actually, the last two years, uh, we have seen some of these applications uh, in the case of full observability for drag reduction for the cylinder case. I will use an off-the-self RL algorithm it's just it's called an actor critic approach. Uh, why it is called an actor critic? Because this is my environment. Actually, this is the fluid flow I want to control. And I will have an actor, which will be a neural network that will be receiving observations from sensors and will produce an actuation such that I stabilize that system. How this actor will be optimized with an optimizer which is also parameterized with another neural network. In that case, this is the critic that is trying to push the actor towards optimal performance. I will show both cases now, and this is actually this part. I will, I, I will tell you exactly how I measure pressure. 
but I want to show you that actually the reinforcement learning is not something magic, it's just a typical feedback control approach that now I will discover a non-linear controller parameterized by a non-linear neural network such that I achieve an objective here to, to reduce the drag. And as you say, here I describe the actuators. I can have either flaps or synthetic jets. And I will use a DNS simulation here. I haven't done the experiment yet. And I can have two types of sensors, either in the full wake or pressure only on the base, as, as you asked. Of course, in the first case, I can assume that I have full observability. In the latter case, I have partial observability. And I will perform this optimization, this reinforcement learning type of approach. It takes me approximately, it's quite expensive, it takes me 200 episodes, 200 DNS simulations to, to train that, and we're talking about Reynolds number 100, okay? So it's uh, data hungry, and I can find, uh, despite that, I can discover policies, a specific policy specifically, that reduces the drag, and we can see the drag from the limit cycle solution goes almost all the way to the minimum drag that I can achieve. And the actuation as well, ideally here I would like to have zero actuation, but there is some, still some reminiscent actuation because I interrupted the optimization prematurely. So uh, this is with full observability, the drag coefficient, and I can have either eight or 64 sensors in the wake, it doesn't matter. I can even go down to three, but they have to be in the wake, okay? However, when I go to partial observability, the drag coefficient is actually only a tiny portion of the drag reduction I achieve with uh, the full observability. And actually, the reason behind that lies on the underlying assumptions of reinforcement learning. Uh, there is, uh, so th the whole idea about reinforcement learning is based on a stochastic approach that assumes that my underlying process and the control is actually a Markov decision process. What does that mean? That if I want to take an optimal action in the future, I have to know, I have to have full knowledge of the present to find what is the action now that will minimize or manipulate the state in the future, okay? However, this is not the case when you have only partial observability. You observe only a small uh, part of your state, so you cannot really take the optimal action in the future. And uh, the solution to that actually lies on Tachin's uh, delay embedding theory that tells me that instead of having only one partial observation, if I have a time-delayed set of observations, I can fully reconstruct my future. Think of yourself like being lost in a labyrinth, in a maze. If you know only now where you are, you will never be able to go out. But if you keep history of the labyrinth, you will always find a way out. And this is actually summarized in Tachin's theory, that if you have a set of delay uh, embedded in the observation signal, you can reconstruct the future. So now you can transform the partially observable mark of decision process to a fully observable mark of decision process under some actually assumptions that are not so easy, like you have to have an infinite number of past observations, etc. But nowadays we can do exactly what Tachin suggested that many years ago in a modern machine learning way, and I can discover what is actually my optimal delay embedding using recurrent neural networks. So the recurrent neural networks will tell me exactly what is the best way to keep information from the past, how back should I look at, and also, even if I want to include nonlinearity in that case, it should be straightforward. So the two types of recurrent neural networks we examine here is gated recurrent neural networks and LSTMs, long uh, short-term memory. And on the left, I show some results with a delay embedding that actually we produced recently. Uh, by having three past observations, we can increase a bit uh, the drug reduction. When we have this modern actually uh, neural networks, we can discover better delay embedding. We can see at the initial stages, we can achieve almost the drug that we had in the fully observable 
case and we also think that if we perform some more tuning and define a bit better the objective function we can achieve the results of full observability only with partial observability so this is the last slide i will show you today based on this interpretation now based on this assumption of having recurrence actually we can start thinking of the actor as a non-linear neural network as a non-linear digital filter that not only we have a function of the present but also of the past and this is exactly the definition of a non-linear digital uh, filter which means that we can apply tools from control theory directly to understand the behavior of the neural network now and what does that mean i can think of the actor as an input output system and i can perform a frequency analysis so in that case on the x-axis i plot the input frequency at the neural network on the y-axis the output frequency and if I force the, free, the, the neural network at a specific frequency and it responds only at that frequency, that implies linearity. And we can see actually that the optimally discovered nonlinear non neural network is mainly linear. The response is at the diagonal. So for each sinusoidal frequency, I have the response mainly at that frequency. And we can plot the bold plot associated with this linear response on the right hand side. So I can plot the amplitude and the phase, actually, of the no linear neural network now. And we can see that this resembles a typical second-order system that we can even fit a transfer function and approximate that with a rational second-order uh, linear filter. But now we have come up with a methodology that we can optimally discover transfer functions, non-linear, of arbitrary order. And uh, just uh, to, uh, to address one of the points I made earlier is that I said that CFD is really expensive and is data hungry. So what is the next step now? The next step is going back in the wind tunnel. So I will replace now, instead of having to do a DNA simulation, I can have the reinforcement learning on real time. And within a few seconds of time, I should be able to have hundreds of simulations that probably at the moment they are intractable and directly discover controllers through the wind tunnel experiment. So with that, I would like to summarize, and of course, thank uh, many people that they have contributed to that, Tarana as well. Uh, and uh, I can take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, for this wonderful talk. I think we can open the floor. Any questions? Maybe I had one, George, for the control that you showed for the case that um, uh, when you use the model, you actually, when you apply the control, you end up having um, uh, uh, modes that appear at some frequencies. Uh, is that because that uh, the when you actuate, there are dynamics that are present that are not actually uh, taken account by the model? So if you maybe augment the model, that would be performing a bit better? Yeah. So there is something in control theory that is called bode effect, that if you want to attenuate a certain range of frequencies, you inevitably you will amplify the disturbances over another range of frequencies. And if you have unmodeled dynamics in this region, you will amplify them even further. So I designed the controller such that it amplified at high frequency dynamics. And actually here there is a resonance with the vortex heading that gets amplified. So if somehow I manage to include the vortex heading dynamics in that model, I should be able to design a more, a better controller for that. But yeah, you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. Two questions. In this, in this slide, uh, we can see that as you fix the position, if you want a zimital position of the vortex, so it is the reason why you have a very low spectrum, okay? Yeah. Uh, i like to go two or three slides after when you have a video, when you show the, uh, after, ah, this one, okay? i like to see the difference between T equals zero in the beginning and after, okay, you see very quickly uh, in the first 10% of the, of the figure, the drag 
was changed a lot, and I like to see how is the f the, the view of the of the flow of the flow field. Yeah, sure. Okay. So what happens? Oh, so I, what I can see mm -hmm. in the beginning, I have a small recirculation bubble and t equals zero, sure. and after the recirculation bubble grows now. Okay, exactly. and you have okay. So you have conclusion about this change in the basic flow, and after I have a comment. So here, I'm, this is just a laminar wake undergoing vortex heading, and there is an underlying stable, unstable base flow with a long recirculation bubble that in the presence of vortex heading, the nonlinear modifications of the vortex heading causes yes, a I shorter so recirculation I, bubble. So what I do is I cancel the vortex heading, and I recover the originally unstable base flow, but now this exactly. becomes so stable so this in the presence of the control. Exactly. This is what it is the physical basic yeah, yeah, of the strategy. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have a few comments. Uh, perhaps nearly ten years ago or eight ten years, we would do a lot of experiments in sphere, disk and cube. Cube is very interesting for your case because it has the same symmetry of the and uh, we was observed the, all the relation of the high nonlinear Lando model. So for example the relation between amplitude of the mode 2 sure. or 0 by respect to mode 1, the strual number of the mode 2 or 0. So perhaps it's interesting for you to see this reference of clots and De coulter. Definitely, definitely I will have a look, yeah. But you're absolutely right, and it's really impressive because all these Landau models, they were derived for close to criticality based on Stuart's assumptions. So it was not Landau's assumption, it was Stuart who said, okay, to find the coefficients, you have to be close to criticality, and criticality is Reynolds number 50. And these models, they seem to hold that Reynolds number 200,000. Okay, I, I have a question for you. Uh, you, you mentioned the meandering mode. And so you have, uh, and you have two modes more or less important. So why did you, you didn't you try to to use a, a two-mode dynamical system? Actually, it is a two-mode, uh, but I haven't gone into that detail. This equation is a complex equation that I showed you. So, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's, what that's two modes mean? You mean? You mean the you have steady the symmetry break and the unsteady yes, symmetry yes. break. Uh, you mentioned, uh, sorry, I missed the, the, the beginning of your talk, but you mentioned the meandering mode uh, at okay. a point. So this equation is a complex equation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. X is bold here, which means that this one is, it has X plus Y or alpha plus theta, E to the I theta. Yeah, that's so the meandering is in the theta direction and Alpha corresponds to the radial mode. Okay. And there was another question. I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand, but it's... It, it, uh, you, you mentioned that you, you wrote a stochastic model just after a few slides after. And there is a, a term in sigma squared divided by r. That's strange. Yes. Because if r goes to zero, then there's a bit of a problem. Yes, actually, this is a bit strange, and that was difficult to derive it. So this arises from the conversion of the equation that I showed you earlier to polar coordinates. So additive noise in Cartesian coordinates for the previous model ends up being multiplicative, appearing as a term 1 over r here. Okay? It's a technical detail. I can give you the details of that, how you end up with this. Okay, so this is the radial component of this complex equation that I had. Okay. And in that equation, I have additive noise in Cartesian coordinates. And during that transformation, you get some extra terms that, but that appear here. When you're near threshold, so R goes to zero, and then you have noise that becomes, the effect of noise becomes large? Yeah, but also you have another term that I think you integrate the PDF with RDR d theta as well. Okay. Any 
more questions? Well, just, with, just before we close, I mentioned that George is with us until the end of the week on the fifth floor. So if you have any questions that you want to discuss uh, personally, you are, I'm sure you're welcome to stop by his office, uh, 516. Sorry, Paolo. <laughs> uh, well, we thank again uh, the speaker, and thank you. Thank you.